Hi, everybody. Welcome to PhotoFest today. Today, we're going to do a virtual tour of our public art program, Public Life, Distance, and Diaspora. And we're so happy that you've joined us. Um, as we get started, I do want to thank our major institutional and individual supporters, the Brown Foundation, the Houston Endowment, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Texas Commission on the Arts, the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance, the Philip and Edith Leonian Foundation, the Powell Foundation, the Wortham Foundation, the WWW Foundation, the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, Judith and Gamble Baldwin, Wendy Watrous and Frederick Baldwin, Katie and Michael A. Casey, David and Martha Moore, Nina and Michael Zilka, the PhotoFest Board of Directors. Um, and I also want to thank all of those donors, but additionally, especially thank the Texas Commission on the Arts and its Cultural District Program for funding Public Life, and, um, which is a 10 month long series of exhibitions. Uh, we're talking about the first installment today. And to also thank Silver Street Studios, Sawyer Yards, Papa's Restaurants, and Lovett Commercial. And as well, thank uh, generous donors to the PhotoFest Annual Fund. Um, Max, could you put that slide up that we talked about? Um, you can give to the PhotoFest Annual Fund by going to PhotoFest webpage or going to um, the going to the app that we're going to talk about today and make a contribution. Um, we really appreciate every donation to the annual fund and gifts of a thousand dollars or more are acknowledged in print and um, we just can't do it without your support. So we really appreciate you helping make programs like this possible. All right, Max, let's, let's begin. Um, so this is uh, going to be a dialogue between myself and uh, PhotoFest Associate Curator Max Fields. And Max organized this exhibition and um, put it together at my request. And because you know, we, were, we were recovering from um, the shutdown of the PhotoFest Biennial and um, COVID-19 coming in like gangbusters. And we were thinking about how can we fulfill our mission? How can, how can PhotoFest um, reach out and do something for the community and do something for the artist um, and do something for the neighborhood and sort of all of those things. And that, you know, we're, we're an arts organization. So the way that we can help people is through enhancing the quality of life and through um, giving people art to look at and through enabling discourses that can happen through that art um, and exchange. And I, I just imagined um, what could we do? And I thought about these buildings in the arts district in our neighborhood. And I thought, you know, if we took, the, took some aspects of the biennial exhibition outside and we put them on the exteriors of these buildings, people that are driving by or people that are walking their dog or people that are going for a walk or a jog, because all these things are still happening, even though we're all, um, you know, we were in lockdown at that time when this was, uh, this idea came about. And, uh, and I had a sense that we we're going to be in that situation for a long time. And, you know, unfortunately I was correct. Um, so we thought about what we could do and we talked about it as a staff and um, I charged Max with the idea of putting three shows together. So we're having three exhibitions that are each a little more than three months long. And this will run until the end of August, uh, 2021. And um, it's a way that PhotoFest can keep doing what it does, um, but in a new way. Uh, much in the same way that we've also done these digital programs, which we began in the summer as well, um, and how our literacy through photography learning program has also transitioned and pivoted to a, a digital format um, so that uh, because we can't be in classrooms and students, for the most part, can't be in classrooms, LTP is connecting through digital means as well. 
So that's kind of the genesis about it. And we, um, we were lucky to have the Texas Commission on the Arts Cultural District Program um, that were, had funds and were interested in enabling projects um, that um, would be safe, but could you know, achieve the mission of the TCA as well to bring art to the people. And so um, we're really grateful that that funding came through because it really made this possible. Um, Max, why don't you talk a little bit about the thinking that you went through to put the exhibition together and then we can talk about some of the mechanics of it and then go into the artists. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the first, you know, after the biennial exhibition was closed and now postponed, many of the conversations that we had outside of just thinking about the safety and security of um, our, the staff at the, at the institution, the artists that we were working with, and the artworks that we're taking care of, we started thinking about um, collective experiences, um, you know, throughout 2020 and trying to find ways of relating those experiences to the work that we do um, as a response, um, you know, through art in a way to, to sort of create some a sense of community and also um, a bit of relief and rest from the constant bombardment of, you know, disappointing or disturbing news. Um, and so the first way that Stephen and I started doing this work was by having conversations about what concepts really define um, shared experiences um, in 2020, not only in, in our private lives at home, but also just thinking about the ways in which we um, engage socially. So the main things that we really came up with was thinking about publicness and the role of the public and what that means in 2020, thinking about community and how communities can continue to operate, um, you know, despite being uh, distant, socially distant. Um, and then we started talking about um, notions of time because 2020 is a year that um, I think can be described as um, a temporal paradox where you work from home and you also live at home. And so time moves by maybe a little bit slower, especially if you're not going out every you know, other night um, or even just enjoying um, you know, social activities with other people, like going to the dog park or going on you know, walks with you know, all of your friends, maybe more than your current pool. Um, but also the times seem to be going simultaneously um, or moving very fast um, because of the news, because every day we were hearing something new about the pandemic. And then we were also hearing news about um, systemic uh, racism and social injustices that were being, um, you know, uh, were being forefronted by the, by the media and also by activists around uh, the globe. And so when Stephen asked to do this exhibition, um, to organize this exhibition, we really wanted to bring in, well, the first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to bring in artists from the biennial because that exhibition was only up for nine days. Um, and so we wanted to give them an opportunity to share their work with Houston and the public. Um, and so we recognized four artists who really typified those ideas of publicness, community, um, and, and, uh, and, and time that really explored those notions. And we related that to the theme that Mark Seeley brought to the biennial by finding four artists who were um, talking about um, civil rights, who were talking about the ways in which media circulates um, and also the ways in which um, the local or the immediate can be linked to the global and the, and the maybe uh, Actually, I would say the global and immediate as well, um, because, you know, no matter who you talk to, whether it's in, you know, uh, Portland or Portugal, everyone is having this, having the same um, sort of experience uh, broadly, meaning um, I'm at home today <laughs> and I'm not going. Out. Um, so that that was the, the main thinking about that. And, and 
We also wanted to present an opportunity um, for local artists um, as much as we possibly could throughout these, uh, these three exhibitions. And so for this first exhibition, we brought in Jamal Cyrus. And then the other three artists that we invited were artists that um, either had a connection to Houston or their stories related to the sort of issues that we experience, this city experiences, um, you know, on a, on a uh, constant basis. Issues such as, you know, um, migration and, um, you know, issues surrounding um, refugees, if you, uh, issues surrounding um, representation and issues uh, surrounding social justice and rights. And so the, the four artists that we chose were Jamal Cyrus, Eric Gianfi, uh, Zina Sarawiwa, and Ida Silvestri. And I'll talk a little bit more, uh, more in depth about those works um, as we move forward. And I'd like to say also that <clears throat> because of some of those artists, and two of them in particular, there is this idea of intersectionality and the way there are, um, there are issues of race, but they're also intersecting with issues of uh, migration or issues of um, underrepresentation, as you were noting earlier. Well, let's, um, why don't we show since, okay, and if you're not in Houston today, it's pouring rain. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, Max and I were intending to do this from inside anyway, but it's a really good thing that we were <laughs> intending to do that. So Yes, this is a still image behind me, um, and that's uh, that's our Jamal Cyrus image, which is on the facade of the PhotoFest offices right now. Um, yeah, why don't we go into this presentation, Max? It looks great. Absolutely. Um, so another another aspect that Stephen and I have been talking about, because public art wasn't the very first thing that we thought about. I mean, we had um, the immediate conversations where, well, how do we present something in a gallery, even though, you know, only three people at a time could see it. And then it was like, well, do we do everything in print? Do we do um, all of our exhibitions online? And <laughs> we agreed that, you know, while those attempts are, are noble, um, they're perhaps not the most, um, they don't reach as many people as, you know, we would, we would really want to, they're not always um, effective in reaching the local communities within which we work, which is very important to PhotoFest and its mission. Um, and so we thought about a, a, a more passive experience that affects, um, that would have an effect on the local community, the passerby who's riding their bike to get some exercise in the neighborhood within which we were presenting these artworks, which is a neighborhood um, where PhotoFest is headquartered. And, um, and also I sh I'd like to add, Max, that since PhotoFest moved into this headquarters in 2014, the neighborhood has changed immensely. Not only the sort of complex, which has become known as Sawyer Yards, a complex of artist studios, but um, there have been even more new homes built in the area. Um, there's an apartment complex being built right across the street from PhotoFest. There's a new one that's opened up down the street from PhotoFest. There's a another one that's within walking distance. So um, a lot more individuals have been coming into the community. And um, if you've ever driven in Houston, you also know that Sawyer Street, which is in this district, is one of the busier streets in Houston. And um, we did a calculation. It was something like 2 million vehicles we'll see um, These words. Yeah. Each, each exhibition. Yeah, so it's um, it, it's a it's a huge number. It's PhotoFest's biggest show, biggest attending attending audience. Um, yeah, you know, oh, I was thinking about the biennial, but yes, you're right. Yeah, um, and we're doing it every month, two million a month. Um, so pretty amazing. Um, and we're really thrilled um, about that. So and then, it, yeah, and yeah, talk about this piece, Max, and how how it's specific also to its site. So as, as Stephen mentioned, the photo behind him is, the fo is, a, is a digital rendering of the photo that you see here, which is Jamal Cyrus' New Epic Connections, which was a commissioned work um, by Jamal, or for, Jamal, for PhotoFest by Jamal Cyrus uh, that was created earlier this year, which is, uh, uh, seems forever ago now. Um, seems like a different time. 
Uh, well, it was. And this work actually started, um, this, this essentially was a translation from a, um, a, a paperwork, a work um, made out of torn um, posters that were um, Budweiser advertisements um, titled The Kings of Africa. And I'm going to show you that before I explain it too much. So this is the act, the the full work um, as it was seen in the uh, PhotoFest Biennial African Cosmologies 2020 uh, and er earlier in 2020. And what Jamal Cyrus did in this work was he uh, found these amazing uh, posters that came from a, a 1980s uh, Budweiser campaign that was marketed towards. Uh, African American communities in in the U.S. and their way of marketing towards these communities to buy their product was to uh, commission all of these incredible uh, African American uh, painters to make these uh, historical uh, historical realism uh, paintings depicting the kings and and, and queens uh, of of Africa and providing a bit of a, a sort of like a history lesson. And then, you know, at the end of it, it's, 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 it was a wonderful gesture um, towards a maybe um, not so wonderful uh, product of, of alcohol that was, you know, marketed in places like, you know, the bodegas, the grocery stores and uh, billboards, you know, around some of the most marginalized, uh, marginalized uh, neighborhoods in, in the US. And so Jamal, um, after having visited um, Africa, learned how to do this quilting pattern uh, and or learned how to do many quilting patterns and was inspired to take these um, posters and uh, translate them in a way into or turn them into sort of a, a, a new form by stitching and weaving them together. And they're held, it's very delicate. And then on top of these um, posters, are these little kind of talismans that have prayers in them. Those are the little black um, sections that you see in the very middle. And for this project, for the Public Life Project, what we did was we actually had this image or had this art artwork uh, photographed at an extremely high resolution here in town. And then asked, and working with the artist, we cropped it for the most kind of interesting presentation that we could for the facade of the PhotoFest um, headquarters. Um, one of the interesting things about this work is that um, it's unintentionally site-specific. Uh, PhotoFest is headquartered at a former Budweiser distribution plant. Um, so this Budweiser distribution plant um, was operating in Houston for a couple of decades and then moved out into the suburbs. And when they did move, um, the building was, um, was renovated and um, given over essentially um, to artist studios and to presenting artworks in gallery spaces. So it's a pretty amazing um, you know, transfiguration of space. And so this work is not only referencing um, this sort of like African diaspora and its relationship to uh, a, a sort of cultural, uh, cultural capitalism, but also relates to Houston's own or our own history, Houston's history um, of being a site for uh, the reduction of Budweiser, its um, relationship to, and, and that sort of capitalism's relationship to, to a sort of a life cycle of a city where um, when one thing um, leaves, it creates room for another, for something else. Um, Absolutely. And the new warehouse is visible from 610, actually, if you uh, are out at 610 on, the, on the, the western part of it. And so these are some of the views um, on a cloudy day of, um, of Jamal's work. Yeah, and I would say that that, that cloudiness brings out the reds a little bit. Um, and one of, one of the things that um, when choosing the crop, Stephen and I worked really closely together with Jamal to choose the crop for this image. And one of the things that Stephen brought up that was really important is that we maintain um, the legibility of some of the text um, at the bottom. So you'll see at the tops of these images, I'm just going to use my cursor here. I hope you can see that. Um, 
you know, if as photographers, I'm sure some of you have noticed that there's not enough headroom. <laughs> but we had to balance, um, we had to balance the sort of tops of these images with the legibility of these texts, because one of the most interesting thing was that this massive corporation was really trying to appeal to a sort of African pride by creating these mm, kind of uh, fantastical narratives, or I would say poetic narratives of uh, that are that are you know nonfiction. Um, but in in Jamal's treatment of these images, um, even those texts are cut up, redistributed, and um, and and obscured. And so that's on, um, that's at 2000 Edward Street, Building C, which is the PhotoFest headquarters, world headquarters of PhotoFest. Um, and you wanna move down the street a little bit? And we'll... Yeah, before I do, I just wanna make a note of this. So oh, because yeah. this was a photograph um, of this artwork, one of the, the, the amazing things that actually um, happened that we, that we were pleasantly surprised to see happen was that there are these wonderful shadows because these are three-dimensional objects in the work. So, you know, when you think of PhotoFest, you might not think of, you know, uh, fabric collage or textile collage, uh, but there's one added layer to this is that uh, that's really interesting in its public art presentation is that this is a photograph. This is a, a, a photographic representation of a uh, paper-based work. Um, it's, it's, and so you get these like really amazing textures throughout the work. And if you come and visit it, uh, visit the exhibition and drive by, um, it's, it's great to take this in at a distance of 30 feet, um, but it is also safe to do so outside to, uh, to then walk up and see the amazing details um, in the paper and the way that the paper is uh, cut and folded and overlaid. Um, but yeah. Well, they well, there were 2D posters that then became a 3D object, and they're now a 2D, uh, like a billboard, really, like an extended length billboard. Absolutely. Um, um, go ahead. No, 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 you go for it. Well, uh, I was really pleased that you chose uh, Eric Giamfi to also be part of this presentation. And, you know, Eric's a, a photographer working in Ghana, and um, he he doesn't like the word marginalization or marginalized communities, but I would say that he does have an interest in presenting um, community and presenting underrepresented communities. Um, and uh, he was one of the um, artists. I was very pleased that Mark Seeley included in African cosmologies. And then I was equally pleased that you uh, thought it would would be good to include Eric in this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as, as, as Stephen mentioned, this is a, an artist who's really interested in the, the language surrounding identity politics and who is coming to terms with that by presenting images that are, um, that sort of confuse the idea of, of, a, of, a, of queer representation through photography. And what that means is that Eric is photographing um, in this series, just like us. Um, he is photographing queer friends and his community in Ghana, in his native Ghana. Um, and he's inter-splicing these images um, of his friends in these really intimate moments. Sometimes um, they're portraits of couples who have been together for many years. Sometimes are, it is um, a solo subject, like in this uh, photograph of Obabara, Obabia, um, and then other times there's street scenes that are that they provide you no context for the sort of like gender or sexual sexually sexuality um, of any of its subjects, and that's part of the point. Um, Eric Yonfi doesn't want to um, doesn't want to create a work that only speaks to queerness, um, and he and, and in an interview he said. I want people, when people say, where are the queer people in these images? He says, well, I wanna ask you, who are queer people and what do they look like? Right, and, and so- it, Yeah, he's, and can I read a quote also that I, that I have loved of Eric's? Um, it's from an interview that you can find on the Aperture website. And he's talking about that 
word marginalization. And I think in talking about how he's fighting boxing people in and boxing groups in or feeling boxed in, he's like, once there is a me and a you, everyone potentially carries the possibility of being an other. But marginalization is a very strong word. I do not feel comfortable being framed within that context as it really boxes me in. Some of these situations are difficult to explain, but so many contradictions exist simultaneously and are real experiences. I'm more interested in creating bridges across which we can experience realities other than our own, whether it be those of marginalized people or not. Yeah. And so I'll show you a few images from the installation. Um, so this is actually presented um, right next to PhotoFest's headquarters at the Momentum Climbing Gym at the Sawyer Yards campus, um, right there on 2000 Edward Street and, um, and Silver Street. Um, and what we did was we presented these images, we presented images that were, um, that, that really spoke to Eric's uh, goal for the project, which was to create an image that um, was both um, intimate and relatable despite any sort of, any sort of gender um, or sexuality identity politics. He wants something that he's creating something that's relatable and to um, to encourage a sort of like empathetic response from viewers. And then, you know, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but we decided not to create um, to put the ta the captions right under these images. You can find them. We have banners. If you see here, we have a banner that gives you all of the caption information for all of the works. But why that's important is that if you look at the, the way you read the image is very different after you read the captions. Because Eric is, is a documentary photographer. And so the image tells one story and the text informs you of the background, um, which is a pretty interesting um, you know, way to divvy up the experience of the viewer. Right, to create a relationship between text and image that is somewhat at odds um, with one another. So what we decided to do, is in, in addition to having a banner that forefronts the images, which we know that the casual passerby might not read, is that we created a, a, an app for the exhibitions. And so that if you want more information about, this, uh, about each of the works, if you wanna read a bit about the works, you can visit the app and you can really learn about these artists. And you can learn about the individual works in the series that this was created. And you can um, get a link to download the app from the App Store or the Android Store um, on PhotoFest webpage. Yeah, it's very easy. What I love about Eric's work is it is the the range of emotions that he's depicting in the work. And you know, African Cosmologies is a very strong project with a lot of complicated emotional range and Eric is there's a few artists but Eric's one of the artists that is really providing a space for joy or representing joy that I that I found really refreshing and one of the reasons I'm so glad he's uh, part of this project when you're gonna we're working on having a talk with Eric in in February, is that? Yeah, it'll be with. I mean, yeah. Yes, with Oluremi Onabanjo, um, who is the former director of exhibitions at the Walter Collection. Um, so that stay tuned for that announcement, that formal announcement. We're giving you a bit of a tease um, here with some of our upcoming programs for 2021, and that's that's one that we're really excited about. It just came together actually last week. Um, this was a new addition. This uh, photograph was not represented in the African Cosmologies. Um, biennial, but it was a work that Eric asked us to include. It was one of two that he, um, two photographs that he shot um, at the Abu, Abu Acre uh, Festival in Ghana. Um, and this is a festival that it's an it's an ancient festival in Ghana that celebrates the migration between the um, uh, Sudanese Empire people from the Sudanese Empire to um, Central Ghana, uh, where Eric is from. And in this image, this, these are images of, of ordinary people um, celebrating life. That is what this festival is about. It's, um, 
it is celebrating um it's almost it's it's like thanksgiving it's celebrating the abundance of of food and also being thankful um for the for your communities around you and so this is one of those images where um you to read a sort of inherent queerness into this image um it's 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 difficult right um and that's the purpose of the staggering of these of the sort of images that Eric creates within and, the documentary series. I mean, I I think it gives you a framework in which he would like you to look at the other images too, because it's not it's not I'm only showing uh, queer or LGBTQIA people. I'm showing ordinary people celebrating life. Exactly, and and when Eric and I were discussing this talk that that um, Stephen mentioned. Sorry, Eric. Max. I had to. No, I think it's great. <laughs> I, no, I'm very excited. I'm very excited about it, and I and I would love. Let's just do more behind the scenes um, uh, webinars um, because they're really exciting events, and everybody should come out. Um, but one of the things um, that Eric said when 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 um, when I began this conversation with him a couple of months ago about doing a program was, I wanna talk about the photographic condition. I wanna talk about how photography sets the rules for, uh, or the boundaries of visibility um, for, you know, for a viewer. Um, so, you know, and, and we're also gonna to talk to, um, we're gonna talk about another artist um, next, Ida Silvestri, um, who we did a talk with a couple of months ago um, so if you want to learn more about PhotoFest programs and the artists that we work with, we really try to organize as many talks with the artists so that you don't get this sort of um, very formal buttoned up curatorial speak um, that's talking about the, the, the broad themes um, and that you, you can hear the artist's perspectives. So um, if you're tuning in on YouTube, you can just click the playlist button and watch, um, you know, gosh, I think we did 19 this year. Um, videos. And with all of those talks are archived on YouTube now, so they're a great resource. Absolutely. And so this is the final image. Um, we, we're showing four works by four different artists for this exhibition. I don't think we mentioned that. Except for Jamal. Except for the facade, the photo yeah. facade, right. And that's the, the view from the, the street. And because we're showing these in, in public spaces and we're asking uh, developers and landlords and property owners are, uh, around our neighborhood for space, this has almost been like, um, you, know, the, you know, you could see like the, the, the light pole. That's a very Houston thing is that Houston, you know, is often described as not the most like aesthetically pleasing city. We don't have mountains or a beach or an ocean. Oh, don't run Houston. Down. But it's, but, <laughs> but no, but I love, but I love the sort of charm of, of uh, a kind of Houston's roughness. And so we're it, presenting these works in places that people travel at major intersections. You know where I thought you were going to go with that is just how great the community's been in terms of hosting this project. Um, Absolutely. And we, we've succeeded in getting all the main spots that we wanted. Yeah, we've been um, I think I got frozen there for a second. We succeeded in getting all the main view spots that we wanted and, um, you know, beyond our wildest dreams, we got the key things. So we, we really want to thank Silver Street Studios and Papa's Restaurants and Love It Commercial. They've been wonderful to work with. Yeah, and, and, you know, they are also, you know, one of the things that when we were organizing this, we didn't expect such an incredible response from the people that we, um, we asked, essentially, we asked for donations, we asked to, if they would donate uh, space on their buildings, and if we could put holes in their buildings, and in some cases, um, and we didn't expect such a, um, you know, enthusiastic response from them, but Papa's, when, when we were speaking to, um, one of the Papa's co-founders, what she said was because the restaurant industry has been so, hit so hard by the pandemic, we're so thrilled to be able to help and donate something. Yeah. Um, and to, to do something for the, for the community. So really this, this exhibition is about community in that it's you know, showing photographs that are uh, by, by artists who are interested in the histories and the issues surrounding um, 
their friend groups, um, you know, the, their own communities. But it's also an exhibition that's, that reflects, you know, um, you know, Houston's community and willingness to support one another, which is really nice. Now, the, um, the app uh, that Max and I have mentioned is really important in terms of Ida Silvestri's work because there's a, um, a poetic component to the visual um, and Max, maybe you could talk about how that works um, and, and about Ida's work for a moment. And I'll also just, um, we need to keep an eye on the time so we can take a couple of questions if there are any. Absolutely. Um, so Ida Silvestri is an artist originally from Eritrea now living in the UK. Um, she is an exile um, who escaped Eritrea um, and it's oppressive uh, government regime, um, you know, by way of migrating through North Africa um, and through Southern Europe all the way to um, London, where she lives now. She lives right outside of London. And for this project, um, even this will pass, Ida interviewed other Eritrean exiles who were living in London, who had a story about their journey from Eritrea to the UK, to Europe, actually. Um, and she interviewed them and photographed them. And she removed the sort of uh, your, your ability or, or withheld your ability to um, identify um, the sitter um, in the photograph, specifically because many of these, um, many of these people, if um, if identified would be at risk of deportation or would be at risk, um, you know, by their own government, right? Um, yeah, I mean, part of, part of the reason, um, and besides economic conditions, which is a big reason for migration, there's also a mandatory conscription in Eritrea, which is a big reason that a lot of um, people choose to leave. And amazingly, Eritrea's population is about 5 million, and there are about a million Eritreans that are living outside the country. Um, and, and a lot of that has happened in recent years that they've left. And then, as Stephen mentioned, in the biennial exhibition and other formal in-gallery presentations of Ida Silvestri's um, Even This Will Pass work, the photographs are presented alongside um, these poetic stories, um, or these, they're, they're stories that are presented as poems, um, I would say. And so um, each image has a corresponding poem that describes in detail the journey that the person in the photograph um, took. And if you look at the photograph, you'll see that there's a line here. And in person, these are thread. Um, these are, th uh, uh, yeah, they actually pierce the photograph appears the photograph and these uh, are these little points demarcate stops and places of um, places where transportation was changed from car to train to plane to boat to motorcycle to truck right and so you can see in here um, there these poems just are, are essentially first word first person accounts that were edited by um, Ida that are often quite, they're harrowing tales. And it's exactly the word I was thinking of, Max, is yeah. that they're harrowing. And, um, you know, fortunately, because Ida was able to make these portraits, it means all of these people survived and made it through to Europe uh, and possibly to London, but um, not without a lot of sacrifice. Absolutely. This, this, is a, this is possibly my, um, my favorite of all of the works, um, specifically for these lines, and I'm gonna read them very quickly. The waves are very scary, big and four times higher than the boat. They are crashing into the boat. Waves are lifting the boat up high and dropping it right back down. I'm soaked. We are soaked with salty water. Everything is soaked. Food and water contaminated. People are vomiting. The, pre the pregnant lady screaming from labor pain because of the waves, the boat crashes into a big Mongolian ship I, that was in international waters. I mean, these are incredibly intense stories and um, 
you know, Ida met with these um, with these interviewees, these folks um, who had made this journey um, multiple times to gain their trust because a lot of the sitters didn't really want to talk about this. And one of the things that if you um, visit PhotoFest YouTube and you find the Ida Silvestri artist talk that we did, uh, one of the things you'll hear is that she said, it was quite hard to find these sitters and I had to ask friends of friends of friends because no one really wants to talk about these things. It's kind of, um, let's, you know, we want to leave this in the past because it's quite painful. But, you know, it's it, with this kind of obscuring of the, the sitter, um, it's, it's also, the, or Ida's obscuring of the sitter is also a nod to um, the sort of tension between wanting to provide visibility to this issue and also not compromise the identity and safety of those who are involved. And the, the first sentence of this one tells you everything. I don't belong to either country is the first line. And, um, you know, how, uh, how Ida makes these, you can find out in that YouTube talk, but she, she would interview the subjects and then, um, create the poem based on the interview and the experiences. Yeah. And so this is the presentation. These are on Washington Avenue. Um, there's a new building uh, that Lovett Construction has just built. It's between, if you know Houston, it's between Taco Deli and B&B &B Butcher's Restaurant. And um, this quite, quite handsome building. And these look great on the black glass background. And yeah, let's go to, let's go to Zena. Great. This is on Sawyer Street. Yeah, this is on Sawyer Street. And this is, um, so this is, um, this work is from a series called Table Manners that some Houstonians will be familiar with, not only because of its presentation in the African Cosmologies uh, exhibition, but it was also on view at the Black Art Museum in a solo exhibition uh, that they organized, uh, I believe in 2014, 2016. Um, and there are two series in Table Manners, Table Manners Series 1 and Table Man Manners Series 2. And um, both of those, well, both of those series, uh, for both of those series, um, Zena traveled to uh, the Niger Delta region and interviewed, um, or actually, photographed or to made video of um, various people that she met there and asked them to sit at a table either in their home or on the street or in a restaurant um, and enjoy their favorite meal and one that spoke one that re represented their identity and their idea of home um, and the title of table manners is a nod to a sort of a, a colonialist language. Um, table manners are often thought of, uh, thought of, of, of things like, don't put your elbows on the table, uh, put your napkin in your lap, don't eat with your hands. And Zena makes an argument that those are, um, those rules, those, those manners um, are totally um, out of touch with a non-European uh, dining tradition where eating with your hands is not only polite, but is the proper way to enjoy a meal. Well, it's yet another colonialist overlay. That's right. And Zena has made dozens of these videos um, in these series. We presented series one, um, in the biennial, but for this project, we wanted we had an opportunity to show something we've never shown before. And also, since Zena's table manners works are usually shown as videos, we thought it would be really interesting to show the photographic works that she made while she was videoing um, each of these sitters. And so, what you see in Lila Bari Eats Scotch Egg with Fanta is a series of images that were collected during the meal, and they were meant to be shown as uh, individual photographs outside of the video installation. Now, the video installations have been presented um, even recently in public in uh, New York Times Square as a, um, 
as a public art exhibition. So Xena is really getting a lot of um, amazing attention, deservedly so. I have um, a video of this work. I'm going to just show you a quick clip of it so you have an idea of what her videos look like. So that's just to give you a bit of an idea of how these works exist as um, video pieces. Um, in the gallery presentation of this, of Zena's work for the biennial, uh, what we did was actually present them, uh, present these works um, on a table so that you felt like you were actually sitting with the person who was enjoying their meal. Um, some of the interesting things, so if you follow Zena on her Instagram page, which I highly recommend you do, um, you'll, she regularly provides updates about her subjects and some are really nice, you know, um, you know, X person celebrated, um, you know, their second anniversary with their partner or, and some of them are actually, um, you know, quite intense about X person being kidnapped because the Niger Delta region is um, quite a dangerous place um, to live. Um, so for this presentation, we were really lucky to work with Papa's Restaurant Group um, to utilize the facade of their building and present these in sequence so that you have an experience, um, you know, with the uh, with the artwork that represents Zena's ideas um, in the video works, and also, you know it was really important in talking with Zena that we present works that, um, that showcase the dignity and showcase the power and strength of the sitter. And so we chose this image because of the sort of intensity with him, with which um, Lila Bari eats scotch egg and drinks Fanta. <laughs> yeah, it's very direct, very intense. And so oh, this, this is great, Max. I'm glad you have this slide. Yeah, so this, this shows you a little bit about where these are located and how we, um, you know, how, so this is essentially, this is the kind of main block where PhotoFest lives. We're, we're right here at Jamal Cyrus um, at 2000 Edward Street. And then Zena's work lives right down the street. And then Eric is, uh, you know, not far, is one building over from us and Ida is, oops, um, Ida is, is sitting at the, at the edge of Washington Street um, and, and Silver Street. And so this exhibition is meant to be walkable, but it's also meant for you to stumble upon, um, you know, if, if you're not looking for an art exhibition, even if you're not looking for an art exhibition, I should say. Um, and I'm, I, I included this kind of goofy slide here just to show you that we have a, a mobile app, which I mentioned earlier. And, um, you know, we're working on... Um, you know, updating that for the next round of exhibitions, which opens up in February, on uh, February 20. I love the fact that um, also, you know, Sawyer is such a busy street where, where Zena Sarah Wewa's work is and that it's the Table Manor series. And I can imagine people either um, headed on their way to work after having breakfast or headed on their way home for dinner and, and seeing that image. I just, I think it's a, a really great placement. Um, and 
as Max pointed out, yeah, take a look at the app. Please download it. Um, if you like, it's free to download. Um, and there's no pay to play on it at all. Um, so please use it. And if you use it, let us know what you think works about it and what you think we can improve about it. Absolutely. And then before we get, run into our q and I'm just going to spend a minute um, just letting you know that we have an exhibition coming up. Um, you know, so as Stephen mentioned, Public Life is a, a year-long project um, that encapsulates three different exhibitions. And our next exhibition is going to be on view um, six days after this one closes, on February 20th through May 30th. And it features artists who were um, previously exhibited in our 10 by 10 um, exhibition, which is our... Um, which is an exhibition that celebrates the best, um, you know, and most exciting works um, from our portfolio, Meeting Place portfolio review. And those, um, that, that criteria for best is um, based on a selection provided by uh, 10 reviewers that we invite to participate in that program. And so those artists will be Sitlali Fabian, Anton Guatama, Daniel Handel, and Krista Svalbanis. And, um, I'm gonna scroll by these really quick because some of these works are not confirmed. So you're really getting a first look. Um, so this is work by, new work, very new work by Krista Svelbanis. Um, These are uh, apartment complexes in uh, Eastern Europe and, and you know, in places such as uh, Estonia and Lithuania. With these um, pattern, pattern overlays. This is work by uh, Anton Gautama. And in this work, he was documenting people who um, live in the places within which they work, right? Uh, mostly immigrant families. Um, this is by well, and, and also just fam, fam, it's mostly shot in Asia. And yeah. um, there, there's a conflation between domestic space and commercial space to, you know, in order to make a living. Sit Lali, I love this work. This is by Sit Lali Fabian, who's documenting uh, indigenous peoples in Mexico. And then, oh, and then this slide. I'm sorry, I didn't leave, I didn't make a separate slide for. I was like, where is this? Is uh, from Daniel ha uh, Handel's uh, uh, series Peritos. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that even halfway close. Um, but it's a uh, beautiful photo, photos, um, monochromatic photos of, um, uh, or back, monochromatic back backgrounds with um, these like, beautiful birds. And the title is a reference to, um, to, to queer slang, to slang about queer people or like the gay community as, as, as is it birds specifically? Little, little birds. Little birds, that's right. Little birds, yeah. So that's coming up in February 20. Um, you know, I'm, you know, definitely uh, follow face, uh, follow PhotoFest on Facebook and check out our website so that we can keep you up to date with all of those projects. And remember, uh, we have the upcoming talk with um, Eric Diomphy that'll happen. And then there'll be some public programs around the next uh, round of uh, this exhibition series as well. Absolutely. Well, if any of y'all have questions, um, please uh, chime in in the chat here on YouTube or on Zoom. Um, we have Rick. one. And there's a couple of comments too, right? Yeah, one, one comment. I have to say I was also struck by the sound in these videos along with the bright backgrounds. I can hear the goats, the traffic, the folks talking, children, the sounds of eating. I love that comment. Um, because so one of the th when I said you know Houston is not known as an aesthetic aesthetically pleasing city I've always thought about Houston as a um, sonically pleasing city if you sit at any intersection in Houston you will have the most intercultural experience of your life you'll hear the sounds of trap music coming from you know a, a, a slab you know, or, and you'll hear with Tejano, followed by Tejano music being played out of, you know, a, a, a truck. Um, then you'll see, um, you'll hear the sounds of people getting on and off the bus. You'll hear the squeaks of the bicycles going by, you know, it's just a, 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 
a living, breathing city full of life, and that is, and, and everyone is, you know, kind of sharing the same space, um, even if only for just, you know, a moment. We're all kind of crossing these intersections together. Um, so I love that you picked up on that sa those sounds. And then um, there's another comment. Thanks for the tour. We're 2,000 miles away, but can easily imagine the spaces. That's wonderful. Oh, that's so um, and you know, we're we're doing our part to make Houston aesthetically pleasing. I will say, and also engaging. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your engagement. And take a look at the YouTube page. Look at the um, look at the other uh, uh, videos that we have up from talks and, um, you know, keep watching. And uh, if you're in Houston or in the area, please come by and see public life. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and a shout out to, um, to, to, to Yan Wang Preston. Yes. Um, <laughs> who says Houston. And her is, comment. Who says Houston is aesthetically interesting. Um, I agree, it's interesting. I don't know about pleasing, um, but it's, it is interesting. Um, so Yan is actually one of the artists who will be presented in the third exhibition in the Public Life series, which is called Recording the Blur. Um, Yan's an incredible artist and we're really thrilled to be able to show her work again. And there's a talk with Yan in our YouTube archive already. So check that out. All right, um, I hope people can hear us, but um, Neil, thanks for letting us know this the sound has cut out on you. I can hear Max, so hopefully some of you can still hear us and have a great weekend. Thank you so much for joining us again and um, stay tuned for more. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us.